a GPS collar on them that transmits the location of the animal, but we also have an external uh, dose rate uh, instrument in the collar. So as the animal moves through the environment, we're getting a measure of its radiation sent to the satellites and then to my computer. So this is like a little uh, radiation detector instrument on four legs that eats a lot. <laughs> As it moves through the environment, it tells us what the radiation levels are, and sometimes we get levels that are 37 to 40, so the upper edges of this. I've not seen anything as high as 100. Shortly after the accident, you probably did, because cesium-134 was much more abundant. Okay, uh, ICRP's uh, four endpoints for measuring uh, early mortality, that's premature death, if you're exposed to radiation at sufficient levels. Morbidity, that's a term meaning reduced physical well-being. A redu reduction in reproductive success or chromosome damage. These are the endpoints that the Committee 5 has suggested are the ones you should measure if you want to determine if there's a risk to the environment. These are all what's considered individual level. Uh, you're measuring effects at the individual level, not population community. Now the challenge is how do we use these in a risk assessment? One of the difficulties is that we manage wildlife at the level of the population, not at the individual. We're not so concerned that an individual fish or bird dies. What we're concerned about is the population of fish and the population of birds viable. Do they re remain healthy? So there are some fundamental differences in human and ecological risk. Uh, for humans, the unit of observation is the individual. For ecological risk, the unit of observation could be an individual, a single wild boar. It could be a population of wild boar. It could be the community or ecosystem. So this adds a great deal of complexity and makes it much more difficult than just doing a risk analysis on humans. The end point for humans is lifetime cancer risk. For ecological risk, there's a whole suite of endpoints that you could look at. For, eco for human, the relationships are established. The dose response is established for cancer. If you give um, me the dose that individuals receive, so many grays or whatever, there are formulas that you can plug into and it will give you the probability that those individuals might acquire a cancer. There are no established dose response relationships for ecological parameters. If I tell you the dose to a pine tree, well pine trees might be the exception, but if I tell you the dose to uh, a flower or the dose to a bird, it's we don't have these established dose-response relationships that give you the probability of a negative effect occurring. So all, there's a great deal of uncertainty with all of this compared to the established knowledge that we have for human risk. For example, um, we have a sister discipline called ecotoxicology. This science deals with um, environmental pollutants and the effects of pollutants on the environment like pesticides and uh, endocrine disruptors. And these very good scientists back in 1999, they said, what alters population growth rate? So they went into the literature and they looked at 41 different studies, including 28 species and 44 different types of, in, of environmental pollutants. And they said, what's the most sensitive thing that would affect population growth rate? Is it mortality of the juveniles? Is it mortality of the adults? Is it a reduction in the number of offspring? So let's say this species of frog normally produces 100 offspring. Maybe because of this pollution, it only produces 80. What, what effect will that have on population growth? Or 
is it the time to reach sexual maturity? And by that I mean, let's say a wild boar takes two years before it first reproduces. A delay would be because of an environmental pollutant. It doesn't mature at two years, but uh, matures at two years and seven months, for example. That's a delay in sexual maturity. So, of all these, which ones do you think has the biggest effect at decreasing the population growth rate? Mortality of juveniles. Anybody? Mortality of adults. If you kill 30% of the adults, will that affect population growth rate? Reduction in the number of offspring? Yay! Time to reach sexual maturity? Boo. Oh, one! Yay! Very good. So, no correlation at all due to mortality. The mortality of the juniors, juveniles, and mortality of the adults in all these studies did not affect population growth rate. So these populations are incredibly resilient to mortality because mortality happens all the time. They're constantly being eaten by predators or killed as they cross the road by cars. Nature has a way of producing more than what's needed to keep the population going. Mortality has little or no correlation to growth rate. Reduction in the number of offspring, 31% of the variation was explained by reduction in the, no the, reduction in the number of offspring. So if, if a pollutant reduces my capacity to reproduce, then that's going to affect population growth rate. The surprise was that this had the largest impact on population growth rate. This is something we don't even study in radioecology. But the ecotoxicology group is beginning to look at that. Uh, again, in uh, ecotoxicology, they say extrapolating effects from the molecular level to cells, from individuals to groups of species, is a major object objective in ecotoxicology that has not yet been achieved. This is 2003, but that goal still has not been achieved. So if all these ecologists can't do that, how are we as radioecologists going to do it? And yet one of our endpoints from the ICRP is chromosome damage. They're saying if you damage these chromosomes, it could affect these upper level, biolog uh, upper level biological organizations. But to do that, you have to have a link. There has to be a strong correlation between molecular damage and population individual damage. And that doesn't exist yet. So if someone said, you know, 5% of your DNA is uh, impacted by exposure to radiation, what will be the impact of populations? We don't really know. We can't predict that yet. However, that's an endpoint that the ICRP wants us to measure. So there's a disconnect there. The, of course, they chose this because chromosome damage is one of the primary effects of exposure to radiation. And it leads to cancer. And the ICRP is mainly concerned with human cancer. So it makes sense that when they started looking at environmental effects, they would consider this. But the problem is a lack of linkage. We have good knowledge about the effects of acute exposures to high levels of radiation. We know far less about chronic exposure to low levels. We have lots of data on these kind of parameters. Responses of individuals, mortalities, big exposures, external gamma, using laboratory data. These, however, are not so relevant to populations. These are the type of data that we need, but they, we don't have many of those. They're scarce. Population response, reproductive response, chronic exposures, internal contamination. We need field data. We need to look at effects over multiple generations. These are the most relevant. Okay, the second reason that radiation is so unique as a contaminant is that when high levels of radiation cause 
high, when high levels of radiation cause humans to abandon an area, like occurred at Chernobyl and Fukushima, populations of wildlife appear to flourish. Abandoned towns of Chernobyl, 340,000 people were evacuated. Fukushima, about 100,000 were evacuated. Wildlife increased. With the removal of humans, wildlife around Chernobyl are flourishing. 48 endangered species in the International Red Book of protected animals and plants are now found within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. They were not there, we're, we're told, before the accident. Here in off the coast of Fukushima, um, the fish resource in the ocean is increasing. This is a ratio of catch per unit effort, that is in units of kilograms per hour. If I go fishing for an hour, how many kilograms of fish can I collect? And this is the ratio before and after the accident. So after the accident, you can collect the same amount of fish in a tenth of the time for all these different species. So there, that means there are a lot more fish out there or maybe the radiation caused some kind of damage to their head and they're easier to catch now. Nah, there's just a lot more fish out there. We did some data at Chernobyl. We looked at the long-term census and it reveals abundant wildlife populations at Chernobyl. This is in 1986 after the accident. These are for elk, roe deer, and wild boar. A general increase. Uh, the wild boar population had a crash in 1993. This was not related to radiation. It was a disease, uh, swine fever, in the boar population. Um, that disease hit again this year. I have colleagues who were in Chernobyl two months ago. There are practically no boar. So that disease is kind of a cyclic thing and this drop did not have an effect on radiation. So here you see increases. And in when the humans left, animals increased. Here's another way of looking at that. Same uh, authors. This is... Um, the border between Belarus and Ukraine. Here's that border. So Chernobyl is right in here. The cooling pond of the Chernobyl reactor is right here. These are contamination levels. This corner of Belarus was very heavily contaminated. In fact, so contaminated that they made it a wildlife reserve and humans are not allowed in there. It's analogous to the 30 kilometer zone in fact, it's part of the 30-kilometer zone of the Chernobyl, but this is in Belarus. There are also national parks in Belarus. So we studied animal populations in the national parks compared to populations in this highly contaminated area. These are the national parks. This highly contaminated area is the dark square. These are the number of animals per kilo hectare for elk, roe deer, wild boar. You can see this is between 2005 and 2010. The animals in this contaminated environment are equal to or comparable to the animal populations in the national parks. In fact, the population of wolves is seven times greater in the, in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So this study demonstrates that regardless of potential radiation effects on individual animals, the Chernobyl zone supports abundant mammal populations 30 year, after 30 years of chronic radiation exposure. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Here's another study where we put, uh, this is a, again the border between Ukraine and Belarus. That's, this is Belarus again with that very contaminated uh, section. Actually, this is that uh, Polyeska State Reserve. This is the contaminated portion of Belarus. 
the map goes from 40 to over 7,000 kilobecquerels per square meter. All these green dots are camera stations that we put out, 94. These are infrared cameras that when their motion activated, when an animal walks in front of it, it takes a photograph. The radiation levels had no discernible impact. Our hypothesis was there would be fewer animals in these highly contaminated areas of the park compared to these less contaminated areas. Radiation, we hypothesized, was affecting the distribution of animals. It did not. We had to reject our hypothesis. There was no discernible impact on the present distribution of boar, wolves, raccoon dogs, or red fox within the zone. Instead, other habitat-related and human factors influence the distribution of these animals. The animals choose places to live because it's a nice place to live. Maybe they like forest. Maybe they like prairie. They were not choosing it based on radiation levels. That's the point of this study. Or that's the conclusion of this study. So, there's an irony about radiation as an environmental contaminant. When levels of radiation cause humans to evacuate, populations of wildlife appear to increase. The increase has nothing to do with any beneficial aspect of radiation. We know that radiation causes damage to individuals. But there's a trade-off. It's causing damage, but when you remove the humans, that stress is so, was so great that when it's removed, the animals are able to increase even in the presence of this radiation stressor. Human stress, radiation stress, remove the humans, wildlife can increase. That's the current hypothesis that we're exploring and data supporting that. Increase in wildlife numbers is due to removal of humans and the environmental stresses. Our cars, our industries, our farming, all these things have an impact on wildlife you exclude humans and the wildlife flourish. And this is a book, a, a great book by Mary Mycio. It's called Wormwood Forest, Natural History of Chernobyl. She writes about a visit that she made to uh, the Chernobyl zone. She says, after spotting, she's in a, in a Jeep with a Ukrainian guide and they're doing, uh, they have binoculars and they're doing bird surveys. She says, after spotting at least a half dozen black storks, I pleaded the guide in the car to stop so that I could take a closer look. But the guide laughed and said, this is nothing. There are many, many more of them up ahead. It was true, herons and swans. They took off on our arrival like a big commercial aircraft. Thousands of ducks rose up into the air like a tornado cloud that flooded the peatlands and dozens and dozens and dozens of great white egrets took off. There were so many egrets that I could, not, I could only begin to count them before our appearance made them take off and go deeper into these wetlands. All of the flooded peatlands have become bird sanctuaries, just like this one. If you come here in the morning or evening, the birds make such a racket you would not be able to hear me talk. It's so beautiful, I said, as I looked through the binoculars. If only it wasn't radioactive. The guide said, if it wasn't radioactive, it would be a farm and there would be no egrets. So, humans remove, nature's flourish even in the aftermath of the world's worst nuclear reactors, accidents. Now, we are revitalizing the area for humans. We're removing contaminated topsoil. We're cutting down contaminated trees. We're doing other remediation methods so that humans can return to that environment. And it's very important that they do return. I am totally for that. Don't misinterpret this. Some 9 million bags of radioactive waste, 114,000 locations in Fukushima for putting 
all these wastes. But all of this is detrimental to wildlife populations. So how can we remediate for wildlife? How can we do things for the environment when it's humans that are so bad for the environment? Humans need to come back here. I'm a fully supportive. I'm just making the point that um, it's difficult to do environmental risk analyses when radiation is the contaminant because of the removal of humans. Okay, that's that second one. You guys are being very patient, uh, very good. Let's see, we need a test on this one. Uh, this is a true or false. <coughs> Um, after the Chernobyl accident in 1986, there was a tremendous drop in the populations of animals because the radiation levels were so high. The animals today have not yet come back. It's, a, it's basically a desert there. If you go to Chernobyl now, you will not see any animals. The radiation is really bad and still causes populations of animals to be declined in the Chernobyl zone. True. False. You shouldn't believe me. Everything I said here is not true. Reverse everything. If you go to Chernobyl now, you won't see any animals. Wait a second. What's he saying? Which way is it? <laughs> you should question everything. You need, to, you need to read things yourself. Just because I'm up here uh, lecturing you, don't necessarily believe me. Aha! Uh -huh. Did you see any wildlife? Do you think, was it a desert when you went there? Or did you see viable ecosystems? I'm your mother. Son, you just got back from Chernobyl. Tell me about it. <laughs> did you see any animals? Animals are hard to see. Maybe you didn't see them. But was it, did it look like a destroyed environment when you were there? How about the forest? <laughs>